Welcome to Heavy Networking, the flagship podcast of the Packet Pushers family, a fine technical podcast for IT professionals like you. I'm Ethan Banks, and with me is Drew Conroy Murray. You'll find us on LinkedIn and hope you'll take a minute to connect with us there. In today's episode, security, but security you don't always see. And, and here's what I mean. When you're as well-established a security vendor as Fortinet, today's sponsor, you end up with a lot of your devices in the field. Real-world devices seeing real-world traffic all day, every day, and in Fortinet's case, millions of devices. Uh, yeah, those devices have a primary protection role within the organizations they are deployed, but they play an additional security role, too. FortiGuard Security Services leverages the millions of Fortinet devices deployed throughout the world as sensors, feeding threat intelligence services and making every Fortinet product more capable. Well, that's cool, but 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 why do you care? Well, because FortiGuard Security Services are a silent component of your Fortinet solution that you might not even know is there, but it's the piece of the security solution keeping it up to date from the latest attacks. Now, I know you have questions. Which Fortinet products leverage FortiGuard Security Services? Do you have to go to a training class to use this feature? If a FortiGate firewall is being used as a remote sensor, what's happening to your company's data? How are zero days handled? To answer those questions and more are Alex Samate, Field CTO and VP of Product Development, and David Lorty, Director of Product Marketing for FortiGuard AI-Powered Security Services. David, welcome to the show, and I want to hand this first question off to you. Uh, I alluded to it here in our intro, but but in a nutshell, would you tell us what FortiGuard Security Services are all about? Yeah, Ethan, thank you. Uh, so what we call the FortiGuard AI-Powered Security Services really represent a portfolio of about 20 security capabilities that are tightly integrated across FortiGate, uh, NGFW, and NGFW-based solutions here at Fortinet. But they're also integrated across uh, our broader portfolio of cybersecurity uh, offerings here. And what they really represent, right, are uh, this collection of capabilities that are meant to address a number of different threat vectors, right, whether those threat vectors are network-based threats, uh, web-based threats, email-based threats, and so on, as well as help us uh, effectively address on behalf of customers the whole full range of threats, whether that's known, unknown, uh, emerging uh, AI-based threats, and zero days, of course, right? So it just represents a collection of these powerful capabilities, tightly integrated, that really bring kind of the, the security strength to FortiGate and other solutions, right? So, you know, I'm kind of reminded of that old uh, slogan out there of, you know, by BASF that, you know, we don't make the products you buy, we make the products that you buy better. That's what these are doing, right? They're bringing really advanced, powerful security capabilities across all our different offerings here at Fortinet, uh, which enable, you know, customers to address a number of use cases beyond just the traditional uh, NGFW use cases or use cases across some of these other offerings. But it's, so it's the it's the deep packet inspection stuff. This is this is where the FortiGate is looking deep and other products across your portfolio, as you pointed out. We're looking deep into the packets. We're looking at flows. We're examining things at a at a much more intelligent level than just just a five tuple and filtering. We're we're wanting to understand what the payload is and whether or not that might be a threat to my organization. Yeah, absolutely right. So we're talking about you know capabilities to your point, right? Intrusion prevention. We're talking about DNS filtering, URL filtering, antivirus, uh, sandboxing capabilities, just to, you know, CASB, DLP, and so on. Just a host of capabilities that are doing everything that you, that you talked about. And in some sense, besides these being these core uh, security services, right, that, that a lot of us are familiar with, the fact of the matter is these are all back-ended by our FortiGuard Labs threat research team. So uh, in a sense, right, this is the kind of a manifestation of all the threat intelligence that we are developing and applying on behalf of our customers, right? Protecting their environments through these individualized services. And one of the best things about uh, all of the different FortiGuard security services is that we see all of that stuff across all of the different products that we have. So the entire attack surface is visible to the different Fortinet products. And because we have our products connected together via the security fabric. Um, if a zero day malware comes in via email, you know, through phishing, um, we can see that in our Forta mail and when it gets sent to the Forta sandbox. So not only does that new malware get shared across the entire fabric, um, and so it's immediately protected, we also look deeper into that. You know, we're doing that deep inspection in the sandbox. We can extract 
for example, like the command and control URL that the malware will reach out to. And we can add that to the URL filtering in the FortiGate or uh, FortiWeb or any of the other FortiNet products. And it becomes what I like to think about as micro threat intelligence that is immediately available to all of the uh, products within your network. You mentioned the security fabric. Can you define what that is from a Fortinet perspective? Sure. The security fabric is what we call the ability of all of our products to talk to each other and share security information. Uh, we have a globally available um, API, uh, and we use that same API that customers can use to let our products share um, threat intelligence and, and security information. So in this particular case, you know, the Forta Sandbox might learn the um, command and control URL that some malware has. So what we do is we automatically send that out to all of the FortiGates within the customer's local security fabric to say, hey, this URL is no good. Don't go to it. And if you do, we'll see that and we'll say that maybe this other endpoint is infected and we can notify that endpoint that maybe they need to do a remediation uh, because they're going to a command and control URL. Okay, so the fabric means then the more Fortinet devices that I have on my network, they are all chatting with one another as they discover different challenges and say, hey, look, I just saw this. You should be filter. You other people in my fabric should be filtering for this as well or, or taking some other sort of an action. Uh, that is exactly right. Um, we also expand that to be uh, not just necessarily Fortinet products. We have a number of other fabric ready partners that utilize that same API that I talked about in order to communicate uh, different pieces of security information to us and from us. It's a it's a give and take, not just one way of uh, security information. Alex, you said something that I want to follow up on um, about this, you know, uh, updating a URL to say, oh, this is a command and control website. You shouldn't go there. It's not just going forward. You shouldn't go there. It sounds like, you know, if I've got an agent on endpoints, those agents can say, oh, it looks like you know, one of our endpoints went there an hour ago, maybe we should investigate this endpoint and see if anything bad happened. So it's only, it's not just proactive, it's sort of acting, can look at past behavior as well and bring that up to date. Yeah, we have uh, what we call our indicators of compromise. So um, those are things that are that have happened in the past that we now have new information about. So mm -hmm. we can take a look at the historical data to see if that's the case. In this particular case, the command and control URL is a definite you know, a definite sign of something that, you know, a user probably wouldn't do normally. But um, even outside of that, we can also look at past behaviors like maybe a string of non-malicious URLs, but we know that's part of a pattern of a certain malware that it will go and check these certain things. Um, we can then say, hey, that one might be compromised and we should do some further investigation on that. Got it. So the benefits are in some ways retroactive in addition to being proactive. Uh, yes, both directions. And, it, you know, it's always interesting to see in some of those cases where some of those retroactive um, intelligence that we can look at, le you know, might lead us to further information behind that because, you know, the malware might have come from somewhere else. And if we don't le necessarily know that at the time, that can lead to new indicators of compromise that we will share across the entire global part of FortiGuard's threat intelligence. Okay, so we've got into one use case. Are there other major use cases for these FortiGuard security services? And is this something that I or my security team is going to have to spend a lot of time configuring on all of my, you know, firewalls, uh, IDSs, client agents, and so on? At their highest level, right? You know, because this is a collection of of twenty or so different services, right? And and when we talk about them, kind of spanning, you know, application security, web security, NOC, SOC, uh, kind of operations, content security, and and so forth. So there's a number of use cases as a as a collection of services, right? Because ultimately, what this what these allow us to do is are protect customers from all manner of threats. Then there's use cases at the individualized level, right? So we talked a little bit about intrusion prevention earlier, right? Where we're doing deep packet inspection, SSL inspection of of network traffic, right? So it's addressing a very specific use case in that regard. But because these are all tightly integrated into are broader solutions. They're contributing either, either directly or uh, in part to those larger use cases, right? So we think about uh, you know, SD-WAN and, and NGFW being based as part of that, they're helping provide a secure SD-WAN solution. Same with SASE, same with FortiMail as, an, as another example, right? They're contributing to those email security capabilities through things like the AV engine, through Andy spam uh, and so forth. So 
um, really they they help us deliver on a lot of different outcomes overall, whether it's each individual service by itself uh, in terms of its functionality and purpose or as part of a, a bigger overall use case. And as terms of configuration, um, actually, it's rather it's rather simple. So for, you know, if it's a NGFW, uh, uh, somebody has a FortiGate, they can go right into the console and they're going to see these different capabilities and the features that they can uh, configure as part of that really makes it easy, right? We're not talking about services that are separate. You're logging into some separate portal and you're configuring. These are all integrated into our, our major consoles for, our major, for all of our offerings to make it as easy as possible for administrators to configure. Well, this can configuration essentially turn it on or turn it off. I'm, I'm using these services or I'm not. Yeah, that's about it. Um, you, you're just basically going to add your subscription credentials and the services will be enabled. Okay, so then it sounds like there's a subscription component to FortiGuard Security Services? Uh, yeah, so the, the subscription is really just based on your account. And what it does is it is giving you all of the latest updates for whatever security inspection that you're doing. You know, it's most important to have, obviously, the latest threat intelligence. And for some vendors, when you have a subscription and it expires, uh, then the security inspection is disabled. We think that the security inspection is really built into the product um, and we don't want to disable it. So it will continue to function normally, even if your subscription expires. And it just means you're not getting any further updates. So, you know, for everything up to, let's say, yesterday, you're still going to be protected. It will still keep mm -hmm. on operating. But any new threat uh, intelligence that comes out, you won't be protected unless your subscription is up to date. It sounds like there's a license fee here or some kind of payment I have to have to, to subscribe. I'm, I'm paying uh, Fortinet for this, these security services. So it depends on the on the particular uh, Fortinet offering that we have, because there's a little bit of variation in terms of uh, how the licensing works. But if we talk about, uh, for instance, our next gen firewall, uh, FortiGate Solutions, uh, you can subscribe to these services either through bundles um, we have three different bundle options in that regard, which you know basically make it easy for organizations to kind of pick the right mix of uh, services and support services uh, that they need, or you can do a la carte as well. So lots of flexibility in terms mm -hmm. of addressing whatever use case the customer has in that regard. Um, but you are paying for these services, right? It's a it's an annualized uh, ongoing subscription model. Uh, overall. Now, in some of the other offerings that we have where some of these services are integrated, uh, it may just be that they're part and parcel to the overall solution itself, right? So, for instance, um, our email security solution, Fortimel, uh, has, you know, anti-spam and other services there. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily get those separately uh, or opt out of those services as part of your Fortimel because they're really kind of integral into what we're doing from a from a mail security standpoint. Got so it. it depends on the offering, but um, uh, we make it very easy to uh, uh, subscribe to these different capabilities and of course uh, configure them as well. And Alex, as you mentioned, if I decide to opt out at some point, you know, it's not like these services just get turned off. I just don't get new updates after I've opted out. Correct. Now, one of the cool things about this service, about FortiGuard Security Services is that Fortinet is able to use all the Fortinet devices that are in the field as sensors and then use the data gathered by these devices effectively being deployed as sensors here to learn more about threats that are going on globally. But of course, that also puts up a flag in my mind because if I'm working for a company that's got very sensitive data and I'm worried about where my data is going and I have data governance concerns and all of that, um, ugh, can I opt out of my de Fortinet device being used as a sensor? Or, or can you maybe tell me how it works so that I'm, I'm comfortable with this feature and function? We collect uh, anonymized data uh, about the event that happened, you know, like what is the source of the alert, uh, the type of alert it is, and any, you know, uh, PII or anything else is stripped out of that. So we're, we're making sure that no sensitive data is leaving your network and coming to ours. Um, all of that information can be sent to FortiGuard's uh, network, which is distributed throughout the world. It helps us gather information about threat trends and efficacy. And a lot of these things we put together in a, um, a quarterly report uh, that FortiGuard Labs put out uh, about what the different trends are in the different regions and different areas of security. 
So when, when you talk about um, trends, something like we're seeing a surge in this very particular kind of an attack that's against, I, I saw something either in a document or, or on your website currently, like uh, it was Adobe Cold Fusion. There was some kind of a, a high risk vulnerability attack there. That Do you mean that kind of a trend or other things? The same kind of trend that you saw on that, which is probably our outbreak alerts page. Um, and we gather this data and obviously it is gathered over a long period of time so we can see you know when those peaks and valleys hit especially like something like a new news source uh talks about uh, a new threat um there is usually an uptick in that you know particular attack that we see coming in from all of these different sensors now customers themselves do not have to contribute to this if they don't want to we um mm -hmm. have an opt-in uh philosophy about that so, you know, if you want to contribute to this, you can, um, but you do not have to. Um, but for all of the different sensors that we have, it is a, a you know great source of information to help our threat researchers keep up with what is going on today. It's obviously not the only source of information, but actually looking at that real world data helps legitimize the trends that we're seeing elsewhere. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'm going to be opted in by default. I can opt out if I want to, but of course, for the, for the, for the better state of cybersecurity globally, ideally I am going to be opted in. But again, if I'm still a little bit anxious about that, Alex, um, I want to drill into to something you said here. You said we anonym we collect anonymized data about the source of the alert and the type of the alert. So just give me an example of that. Like the source of the alert is in like, like an IP kind of a source. What do you mean by source and then type of alert? Walk yes. me through that. So, so the source can be the IP address, but what we extract from that is really the source location where it's coming from, where, you know, we're going to do like an IP to geo location so we can know that, you know, maybe there are attacks that are, um, you know, kind of being sourced from a particular country or a particular region. Um, the other the other interesting thing I see from the trend is when things, you know, happen time wise, like during the day or the night, you know, is it going to be after business hours or during business hours or is it during the business hours of where the attacker is coming from, not necessarily yours. So the type and the type of alert can be, you know, is it a you know particular threat? Is it malware? Is it an exploit? And what is the, you know, the CVE that's happening? Um, it's not necessarily giving data about the you know, the particulars of the exploit itself, like, you know, what, what, uh, you know, what did they use to, to uh, potentially try and compromise, but at least it's giving us that information so we can take all of it as a whole and pick out all the trends that we're seeing out of it. Um, as far as the PII piece, so any, obviously, uh, usernames, uh, host names, those kinds of things are taken out of the data, so we don't have access to that uh, if we don't want to, and if you know the customer is sensitive enough that they don't want to share any of that, they can opt out of sharing any of that data. But more is better, um, especially when trying to detect global trends and emerging attacks and and so on. More data from from Fortinet's perspective, more data is better. You get to glean more and then um, come up with maybe a a fix for a particular compromise or a vulnerability that's being seen out there and and send that patch out to everybody that subscribes. So so ideally we want everybody to be opted in if at all possible. If if we can, I mean obviously yes, more data is better for uh the global view. But you know, again, it it's there's no requirement for sharing that global data. Um it helps the overall threat intelligence be better. So you know, um I, I like to think of you know, kind of the security community as being very helpful with one another. People do want to share that kinds of information. Um, but again, like you said, some companies may be, you know, sensitive to the data that's coming out. Um, if there also may be concerns from a legal perspective about data sovereignty, uh, you know, yeah. about where that data has to, you know, stay located at. So with that in mind, we do have that ability to not send the data if uh, the customer desires. So you mentioned threat intelligence, and it sounds like Fortinet has a separate threat intelligence service along with FortiGuard security services, which is essentially like sensor data from all my security devices. How do those things work together? Is one feeding the other or vice versa? How to, can you talk about how they relate and, and work together? Yeah. So, you know, kind of the best way to think about this is so we've got our FortiGuard Labs, which is a Fortinet's threat research team, right? And, and this is a team composed of data scientists, researchers, threat hunters, engineers, and so forth. And they are directly responsible for the development, the ongoing enhancement, and, and the enrichment of the FortiGuard AI-powered security services altogether. 
right? So, so they're, they're the entity behind this collection of services and, and the intelligence that is feeding into these services, you know, minute by minute. If you think about, you know, intrusion prevention is one of the uh, key services as part of the portfolio, uh, right? They're the ones who, who are developing and maintaining a, a database. And I think when I looked yesterday, it was just over 19,000 signatures uh, related to that, right? But they are the ones that are making sure that, you know, they're, they've got visibility in the threat landscape. When they see something new, they are developing count the signatures that they're validating uh, the efficacy of those or watching across uh, customer environments in terms of uh, how are those signatures working and so forth. So they really are the the force behind this portfolio. It sounds like FortiGuard Security Services is kind of like, you know, a lot of raw data and then you have the the lab team sort of make sense of that data and, and get signal out of it. Uh, absolutely. But I, I wouldn't want to understate that they're also directly involved in the overall engineering, right? Mm-hmm. The development of these as well. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And those same FortiGuard researchers, while they're out, you know, scanning the dark, dark web and, you know, looking at a lot of the different um, uh, publicly uh, available information, looking for new threats. Um, Fortinet both uses and contributes to a number of different external threat intelligence services or feeds. So a, a really good example of this is the Cyber Threat Alliance. Um, so the, the CTA was founded by you know a number of security vendors, uh, Check- Checkpoint, Cisco, Fortinet, and Palo Alto. And it was a, meant as a way of sharing the threat information we all receive, um, and it is not meant to, you know, contribute to the competitive nature of all of these different companies. Um, I think today there's around 36 different companies uh, within the CTA, and mm-hmm. we all, you know, freely share the threat intelligence that we we get uh, from from all of our different sources because we want, you know, in the end, all of our customers to be more secure. Now, just because we share information, it doesn't mean that, you know, we just automatically put stuff, you know, into our various respective products. Um, Ourselves, as well as the other members, they have to then vet these, um, you know, different threat intelligence that's coming in. They have to develop uh, the engineering, as David was talking about, to make sure that that fits into the product, uh, you know, very well um, in in that they are looked at and vetted by people to make sure that we have the highest level of, of, of signal and, and threat intelligence. Got it. Okay. So FortiGuard Security Services is helping to inform the threat intelligence team, but they're also working with other sources of information as well as partners in the industry and also vetting information that comes in to make sure it fits right with um, the, the, the Fortinet platform. And that's something that benefits everybody, you know, across the board. So, you know, while we, we see it as that source of information, uh, to you know, bring in some external threat and in information. We you know value it as the you know kind of community um, uh, global community that we have that shares that same threat information. Got it. Now you guys have talked a lot about signatures here, which takes me back to the day of being an antivirus administrator. And did you have the latest signatures? And if you don't, you're out of luck for those latest latest attacks, whatever they were. Um, am I thinking about that the right way? Because because where my brain is going is zero day attacks. I mean, if there's no signature in my 19,000 odd signatures here that have been identified so far, what what does that mean for a zero day attack? Yeah, so great question, right? And and I think we've only been talking about, you know, the signatures just using IPS as a as an example. But but of course, we've got other heuristics. We've got other uh kind of capabilities overall with with regard to what we do. So I think let me take this back to kind of FortiGuard Labs and and you know the, it's this large research organization, right? We've got tremendous visibility across uh, the millions of devices out there and and virtual instances that we we have across our customers. We've got uh, visibility into uh, threats as a part of the collaboration with public and private organizations and and other infrastructure that we have uh, uh, deployed across the you know the internet. Uh, this team is is constantly seeing uh, new and emerging threats and and trying to determine how best to you know provide or develop countermeasures associated with that. Right? Uh, if you think about a, a, a zero day threat, uh, you know being identified immediately, they're going to look at how how can we effectively address this on behalf of our customers. 
and put some type of protection out. So we're absolutely, we're absolutely well beyond just, you know, looking at signatures. We just use IPS as kind of that example in the conversation here, but, but we're actually, you know, employing a lot of different, um, uh, uh prevention detection capabilities or or tools overall including uh things that we're doing with uh, machine learning and so forth right to ultimately drive the efficacy of of the different services that we're talking about here yeah well that that all makes me feel a bit i guess better in the sense that i mean 20 years ago we were talking about uh, signatures being old school and that's the old way to do it and you don't really want to do it that way and you've got to use heuristics as you mentioned and come up with behavior recognition and uh, this is bad behavior as opposed to looking for basically just doing uh, pattern matching. Um, so what you're saying here is it's not just, yeah, there's signatures and we identify those, we roll those out, but that's not just, that's just the beginning. There's also lots of other ways that you're identifying various threats, including, um, well, would it be fair to compare it as uh, like, like an unknown threat, a zero day threat, something that we haven't really seen yet until just now. And, there's, there's ways that you can identify what's going on, zero in on it and get a solution deployed. Yeah, that, that's absolutely, absolutely right, right? I mean, we, we have to have the visibility to, to basically look at these and determine something that is, is new, unknown, uh, and develop a countermeasure. Otherwise, we simply wouldn't be as effective as we are, right? That's just part and parcel. And in, in some sense, I could argue, right, there's kind of this idea of, you know, known and unknown and closing the, the that window of time between what's unknown, right? We immediately see it's, we haven't seen this before and turning it into uh, something that is known that we can protect our, our customers against. Uh, but there's just tremendous activity that, that the FortiGuard Labs team is doing in this regard uh, at any given moment. Right. And just, you know, one thing to kind of expand on in terms of uh, some of these capabilities, right, because, you know, of course, AI is a hot topic. Um, we've been deploying, you know, various AI technologies across these different services uh, for well over 10 years. We've been doing things with machine learning and so forth. Right. So, you know, there's a number of different capabilities that are powering behind the scenes of each of these services. So, for instance, you know, we're using uh, uh, AI capabilities to help with the categorization of, of all the different uh, domains and URLs that we're seeing, right? So that organizations can can protect against web-based threats and and so forth. So we're, we're applying a lot of different uh, capabilities all around. And if you think about it, it, you know, in some sense, you know, whether you use signatures or not, the question really should be is what are the, the underlying uh, tools, whether it is signatures, heuristics, behavioral analysis, uh, uh, anomaly detection, so forth, and uh, anything else emerging, what is going to be effective in, in helping us protect our customers? That's kind of the better way to represent that. I mean, it makes sense that when you're dealing with the volumes of data that you must be ingesting uh, from all these devices that you'd want to use machine learning and AI. Um, are there specific things Fortinet can ask AI to detect? Well, we have a massive store of malware and other, you know, kind of bad, uh, you know, cybersecurity threats that we have kind of in our stores. And it's a great uh, set of data to do things uh, in training, you know, AI and ML. So what we want to, you know, like for malware, as an example, what we wanted to be able to do is distinguish quickly something that is, you know, either malware, not malware, or maybe needs more investigation. So those those three states, you know, we have a, you know, a neural net that basically we can feed in files. And, you know, this neural net has, I think, you know, you know, billions of different nodes. Ba basically, what those means are different characteristics that we've extracted from all of the, the data that we've seen so far. And we try and categorize that and say, you know, yes, it has some of these indicators of of those things, even though we've never seen this file before, we are using, you know, past knowledge to train the the model to look for those things. And if it says, oh, yes, this is something is doing is definitely doing something bad, we can spit out that result very quickly. If we can know that it's clean, we can spit something else out that says, hey, it's clean very quickly. Um, the other thing that we can do is we can say, well, we're not quite sure. And here is all the things that we think it's doing. And we can then, you know, pass that on for further scrutiny. It'd be like a sandbox or some secure deployment environment to let it run and see what actually happens and then make a further analysis. 
Um, either that or maybe even re a threat researcher themselves that is going to look at that. So regardless of the outcome of the AI model, whether it's what, you know, any one of these uh, things, we're still going to want to have uh, a human uh, that vets the information that comes out of there. Because, I mean, we already know if we've, you know, with all the hot topic about, you know, generative AI, you can ask you know, uh, any of the generative AI things to write you a paragraph about a subject, but you better read that and make sure that it's correct <laughs> before those you references. send that off. Check yeah. those references. <laughs> so it sounds good, but it may not be factually correct. And that's something that we really want to make sure that our threat intelligence is factually correct. We don't want to have false positives, you know, in, in the results. So we have to really make sure that we do the right things in order to make that happen. And that might include some things like um, if we have a preliminary, um, you know, uh, 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 signature or detection method, we, we might put that in the product on, you know, like as a read only. So, you, you know, like you don't get to see that, but the signal that comes back to us will let us determine whether things are uh, false positives or not and allow us to fine tune that in order mm. to get the detection exactly right. So, so do you guys share publicly what's going on with FortiGuard Security Services? Is there some kind of a, a dashboard that gives insights into maybe like global threats that you've uh, you're seeing out there? Yeah, there's really a, a couple great resources you can find. So, first would be uh, fortinet.com forward slash uh, FortiGuard, and that's going to take you right to uh, information on FortiGuard Labs. Uh, it's going to also uh, show you various uh, outbreak alerts. Right, we put those out. Uh, uh, could be at any time just based on something we're seeing that's of particular concern that we're trying to report on. Uh, and then also you can find a lot of information uh, in terms of uh, uh, threat data, trending, et cetera, on FortiGuard.com. So a couple great resources, but I would start with the uh, first one. And uh, David just mentioned FortiGuard's outbreak alerts, and it's a really great way of getting yourself informed and digesting these new vulnerabilities. So you know, the FortiGuard outbreak alerts includes a timeline of, you know, when this was happening, um, a, an explanation of what exactly is going on with that particular threat and, and outbreak. Uh, and this includes a video uh, that, that is done by one of our uh, Fort, uh, FortiGuard Labs uh, threat research team. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we present it in a way that utilizes the NIST framework um, so we can take a look at where in the kill chain that the various pieces of this particular uh, outbreak is happening and which you know databases or signature sets or you know uh, ML, ML models are, are going to be needed in the Fortinet product in order to block this particular um, attack. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Okay, so there, there, there was a lot there. Um, uh, Dave, were you going to add something? Um, yeah, so you know one thing about the outbreak alerts too, just to keep in mind when it comes to the FortiGuard uh, services is that uh, when you're looking at that, you'll see that when we've developed a countermeasure, right, for a given uh, uh, exploit, whatever that might be that we're you know, citing in the outbreak alert, you're going to see that, you know, we're deploying some type of countermeasure across multiple parts of uh, or multiple solutions at a given time, right? So you'll see IPS on there and we're de we've got IPS integrated across a number of different uh, Fortinet solutions. So the more the customers invested in, the more they're going to get those protections deployed simultaneously across broader aspects of their security infrastructure. Same with AVE, same with other capabilities. So it's just a great way to see kind of this idea of more of like a localized network security effect taking place uh, through those alerts as, as you see it. So it's very real, real world in terms of the more you invest with Fortinet, uh, the more you're getting this enhanced security posture through these different services that are that are integrated across broader aspects of your infrastructure than you otherwise would have. And also with that across the board approach, one of the biggest added benefits that a customer gets is consistent security. So because we have the same AV engine that's running on all of these different products, or because we're using the same web content filter database or the same IPS database, all of these things, no matter where they are seen, are seen in the same exact way. You don't have to worry about you know one update being different than another update. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all there and consistent. And you know for some things, there's you know no necessarily set standard. Uh, web content filter is a good example. You know what 
one vendor may categorize as gambling, you know, another vendor may categorize as gaming, you know, and, and if you have those inconsistent results between different product sets, you're going to get different, you're going to get inconsistent security uh, across your own network. And that's, you know, never a good thing. Right. Another great piece of data that comes out of FortiGuard is the yearly threat landscape report. Now, this is what we talked about before, that aggregated view of all of the things that have been happening throughout the year, different um, uh, malware campaigns, different types of attacks that have been on the rise um, that we can see across the entire network. And it really gives you an idea of what is going on out there. Sometimes people find that you know cybersecurity may be a little bit boring and maybe nothing happens. If you look at these yearly landscape reports, you'll see how much activity is really happening, both on the attacker side as well as the defender side. So as a as a resource to you know kind of take a look at, it's something that I would encourage a lot of people to go out and take a look at to stay informed. Oh, if you're hearing that people think security is boring, that's because they're not paying attention. It is endless. You can't keep up with it. There's so much noise of new attacks and new things that are coming out, new exploits, companies that got taken over through some ingenious methodology, write-ups that are being done, reports that are going on out there. And again, as you said, both from a attack and defense perspective, I mean, it's it's too much to keep up with, honestly. I don't know how anyone could think it's boring. So that yearly threat landscape report would be really interesting, a nice a compendium, a good summary of what's going on. Thanks for raising that, Alex. And, uh, and again, Alex Samante and David Lordy, thanks for joining us today on Heavy Networking. And again, if you're listening and you wanted to just dive in a bit more and learn more about what's going on with FortiGuard Security Services, fortinet.com slash FortiGuard is the place to go. And you can go from there off to any of these other resources that we were talking about. So our thanks to Fortinet for this look at FortiGuard Security Services, how they're contributing to threat identification, both at a macro and micro level. Uh, the macro global stuff's cool, but the micro stuff is really cool too, especially if you work in an unusual environment. Now, if you enjoyed this episode and you want more technical content that doesn't waste your time, check out the rest of the Packet Pushers lineup, including weekly industry news and analysis on network break, Wi-Fi and more on heavy wireless, implementing V6 on IPv6 Buzz, all about Kubernetes on Kubernetes Unpacked, cloud services, platform engineering and more on day two cloud and high level technology strategy on heavy strategy. Just search for Packet Pushers in your podcatcher anywhere you listen to podcasts to see our entire lineup. Or just subscribe to the full feed and download every single podcast we publish straight to your brain. But be careful if you do that. It might hurt a little until you get used to it. Last but not least, remember that too much networking would never be enough.